Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Uh, good morning. Merry Christmas. Welcome to uh, what might be one of the most memorable Christmas mornings, uh, at least of my adult life. I I can't think of a better thing to, to do on Christmas morning than to watch one of what might be the most historic launch ever. And uh, this is this one's going to be amazing. Um, sorry, the, the background noise is really loud. Uh, yeah, this is this is this is the big one, my friends. This is like the ultimate rocket launch. This is pretty much the most expensive and most important rocket launch, uh, single mission, uh, definitely in my lifetime, maybe uh, as expensive, it might be the most expensive single launch ever. So let's get right to our pre-launch preview. Don't forget any time you guys uh, ever have any questions about upcoming rocket launches, don't forget to go to everydayastronaut.com and you can go to our upcoming rocket launches and uh, head on over to our pre-launch preview. So this is the James Webb Space Telescope. And uh, my friends, this this is one that's 30 years in the making. So you better believe I'm up. Uh, I didn't hardly sleep last night. Just so excited for this. And when I say didn't sleep, I mean literally, you know, that kind of thing where you're tossing and turning and thinking you're missing the test or missing work or missing some, like I was just tossing and turning all night. Maybe slept an hour and a half, maybe two hours. Uh, cause this is just one of, this is, well, this one's worth staying up and stressing out over because it is, uh, it's, it, let's get to it and we'll, and we'll, you know, we'll see, uh, we'll see why this is so important. So, uh, time of liftoff, as you can see in our countdown clock is about T minus 30 minutes right now. Uh, yeah, so we are really getting in there. The mission name, this is going to be the James Webb Space Telescope, or as you might commonly see it, JWST. Uh, we've probably seen that for years and years coming. The launch provider, who is going to be launching the James Webb Space Telescope, is Ariane Space, um, on behalf of ESA, basically. So the customer who's paying for this is led by NASA in collaboration with the with with ESA, with the European Space Agency, with the Canadian Space Agency, and the Space Telescope Science Institute as well. So uh, this is, like I said, this is a really genuinely huge, huge mission um, with uh, international collaboration galore. Um, the rocket for this is the Ariane 5, the ECA, the extended, the full biggest, baddest, you know, biggest fairing and uh, all the options, all of the, check off all of the options for this rocket because this is the one. The launch location is ELA-3 at Guiana Space Center in French Guiana, in, which is technically a providence of France, even though it's in South America. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, which is cool because it's pretty much right on the equator, which helps gives it that nice little extra boost of energy and a little bit of extra velocity compared to even say launching from Kennedy Space Center uh, or anywhere else in the world sitting pretty much right on the equator you do get an additional bit of delta v to help push the rocket out onto its destination so payload mass this is 6500 kilograms this is a pretty big heavy telescope although it's still about half as light as Hubble so it's quite the engineering marvel that it's uh, able to be uh, you know this powerful and, and and much lighter than Hubble. So, uh, and the crazy thing is this is going very far away from where we are right here, right now. It's going to the Earth-Sun L2 Lagrange point. So that's actually a point between between the Earth and the Sun, or it's, it's behind the Earth and the Sun relative to that. So basically it's kind of sitting as if you were orbiting the Sun, but the, the Earth is constantly between you and the Sun and you're just in this nice gravitational balance where uh, the spacecraft will always have an equal pull between the Earth and the Sun and then centrif centrifugal force as well. So it basically will stay right there with very minimal station keeping. And it's a, it's a very, very cool orbit. So um, to my knowledge, I don't know if we've sent, chat, please let me know. Have, have we even sent anything ever to an L2, Earth moon L2? Definitely not anything this big. Definitely not. And definitely not this, uh, yeah, not this important either. Uh, will they be attempting to recover this first stage? This this part of the article is obviously more about rockets. You know, we tend to really be involved in the rocket launches. This The reason we're watching this mission this morning is because this is the most important science mission, perhaps, of our lifetime. Uh, so, but, so this, some of this doesn't make as much sense, but it normally does. Uh, like, will they be attempting to recover the first stage? No, this is, uh, where the first stage will be crashing into the Atlantic Ocean, as do all Ariane 5 rocket launches. 
Will they be attempting to recover the fairings? Nope, not possible with RN5, so they're brand new fairings. The weather is actually looking good. All systems are green, last time I heard. Uh, pretty awesome. This will be the one, this is pretty much topping the year off with a record setting 138th orbital launch attempt of 2021. This is going to be a, this is already a historic year for rocket launches. This will be the 289th Ariane space mission and the 112th Ariane 5. So of course there were other Ariane, there are other Ariane space rockets. Uh, Ariane 5 is not the only one, although it is very prolific. Um, so if you want to read more about this, uh, incredible science mission, uh, and I, I mean incredible. This thing is has over 300 single points of failure uh, in its deployment mechanism. So assuming the launch goes well, which, you know, really extra knock on wood, cross every finger and toe you have in the world, um, we really hope this launch goes absolutely perfectly today. Uh, you know, the Ariane 5 is an, an incredibly reliable vehicle, so we really are hoping that that is the case. Uh, even then, it has a six month, uh, it has to, it goes online for six months. So there's about 30 days or so where there's a lot of deployments, a lot of things that could go wrong. So it'll be a, a, basically a month of just torture for the scientific community uh, and those involved. And um, having seen the telescope twice in real life, uh, you know, with my own eyes at Goddard and then out in California before it got sent to uh, French, I think that was before it got sent to French Guiana. That was in 2019. Um, hmm, it might not have been quite the, it was pretty close to the final time. Um, yeah, I, I've seen it twice and just seeing how many people, how the scale of it and how many people are working on it, knowing that they've, you know, combed over every single little millimeter with a fine tooth cone. Uh, this one is just, a, a, it's frankly terrifying. I mean, I would not want to be, uh, <laughs> I can imagine how nail biting it is for, for mission control on this one because it, it's all eggs in one basket. Um, but you know the the consequences of this launch are going to be incredible. Like you know, this thing will be able to look deeper into our our uh, universe than anything has ever looked before because of uh, because of physics really. Uh, in order to get you know our our own atmosphere will block a lot of valuable data uh, from optics and from collectors, uh, but. The, and, the, you know, you have things like the Hubble Space Telescope and other space asset telescopes that get outside of our atmosphere that allow uh, the, the sensors to collect more light, collect, um, you know, infrared light and things outside of the visible spectrum, things that sometimes our atmosphere tends to absorb. But this is about the minimum of what scientists believe will help us capture basically the beginning of the universe. And that's mostly because this, this will capture in the infrared spectrum. So um, because of light shift and because of uh, the fact that the universe is moving away from you, a lot of it has shifted into the infrared. So we're literally being able to like look back in time basically with this telescope. Uh, if that doesn't get you excited, I don't know what will. And it's resolution and it's what it's going to be able to detect is going to be off the charts. Uh, this, is, this is the one, guys. So, um, yeah, I, so here's what I'm going to do. I, I'm going to encourage all of you, if you want to hear, uh, first off, if you want to read more about this, please visit our website, everydayastronaut.com, click on upcoming launches. You'll read plenty about the rocket that's carrying this and the, the payload and the scientific missions. This was written by Claire. Thank you so much, Claire, for writing this article. But I'm actually going to do something. I'm going to encourage you guys, if you, I, I'm just going to be talking. I'm going to be answering your questions. I'm going to be yabbing a whole bunch, right? It's Christmas morning, got an exciting mission. I'm going to be yabbing and watching a rocket launch with you guys. That's what I'm here for. I'm here to answer questions specifically, mostly about the rocket. I'm not a planetary scientist. I'm not a, none of that stuff. I'm a space flight enthusiast. So I'm here to answer questions about your rocket. If you want to learn more about the Hubble or about, you can see a good thing I'm not even, uh, about James Webb, uh, please watch the official NASA feed. It's incredibly well done. Um, it's, it's hosted by Dr. Uh, Michelle Thaler, who is an absolute rock star of, of science. So, uh, so listen to them. If you want someone to yab that knows what they're talking about with this, these specific science instruments, please watch the NASA feed. Um, the, the official NASA live stream that is to me, that's, you know, if I wasn't doing this, wanting to watch this rocket launch and, and hang out with you guys and answer your questions, uh, that's where I would be. So just wanted to encourage you. You have the option. Of course, it's YouTube, choose whatever you want, but we've got a lot of questions from you guys already. Um, and including some some fun things like this, like John Bauer is celebrating 12 months of membership on the channel. Uh, that is 
Um, awesome. Uh, thank you so much. That, that really means a lot for those of you that, that do support what I do here. Uh, it, it really, really means a lot. Um, I, I know that uh, <laughs> I, I, I talked about this on Twitter, but uh, you, you might not believe this, but we're actually going to have three videos coming out in basically the next week and a half. Uh, basically in the next week, we're going to have three videos dropping. Yeah, you didn't even think that was possible for me, did you? We've been working really hard on some other videos in the background, uh, trying to get them out as soon as possible. We, of course, have our Astro Awards. So assuming this launch goes well, believe it or not, uh, assuming the launch goes well, this isn't going to make it into the actual Astro Awards. Um, it'll make it into the honorable mentions as a successful launch. So uh, kind of a congratulations to Arion Space. But um, uh, James Webb won't get its Astro Award until it starts collecting mission and its official mission starts it starts collecting data and its, uh, and its official mission starts. That would be success. That will be, uh, so 2022 would be the year that we'd maybe be giving it an Astro Award to the success of James Webb and it would be high up on the list. I'm having a hard time even imagining what else would be that high on a list? I think this this is uh, an absolute shoe in for number one next year, assuming this launch goes well today. So uh, we're going to be releasing the 2021 Astro Awards uh, at the beginning of the year, likely the first or second. Uh, we also are releasing a really fun video that we did last year with you guys. Uh, at the beginning of last year, I, I put out a Twitter poll trying to guess what was going to happen in 2021 throughout the year. We were horrible at guessing. So we're going to go through the results of what everyone voted. Uh, it's, it's a super fun, short little video. Uh, and that's going to encourage us to be able to, on January 1st of 2022, I will be doing a similar poll, hopefully a little bit better on my end, because I didn't do the best job of predicting what to even be thinking about. You know, it was kind of a, a hastily put together set of polls. So this one will be a lot more accurate, a lot more fun. Uh, so I hope that you guys join in that one and see the results and, and see how you did if you took uh, a part in that poll too on Twitter uh, at the beginning of this year. That's going to be really fun uh, <laughs> and just a kind of is a kind of to uh, what's that called? To, I can't even think because I haven't slept. Uh, <laughs> a nice little pairing with uh, with the uh, Astro Awards. So yeah. Um, oh, and then we also have a 27-ish minute video about why rocket engines don't melt. We're talking about all of the deep dives on on uh, on that kind of stuff of how you keep a rocket engine from melting or vaporizing or sublimating. Um, how do you keep them cool? There's a lot of cool techniques huh, that rocket uh, engineers get to employ in order to keep rocket engines uh, at operational temperatures. And uh, we're going to talk to you guys about that. And it's a really fun video, lots of good animations. Uh, kind of back to the classic everyday astronaut, like how does this work type of thing. So hopefully you guys enjoy that. Um, okay, so this is from Musical Wolves. How are you doing, Musical Wolves? So good to always hear from you. Um, uh, Mary Wolfmas, will the rocket be Rudolph the Red Engine after ignition? So, uh, no, the, the, vol the Vulcane uh, doesn't really burn that red, glowing red hot. It is regeneratively cooled all the way down the nozzle. Uh, I'm trying to remember... Uh, what the second stage, it, I'm pretty sure it's also regeneratively cooled and does not have like a radiative, radiatively cooled nozzle extension um, that would be indicative of a bright red glowing rocket engine. Uh, I, I don't recall, but um, yeah, I'm pretty sure that, that there will be no glowing, although the, the SRBs, just the, the flame coming off of the two massive boosters on the side of this vehicle uh, will be bright, bright. I mean, those things are stinking bright. And uh, they might not be red, they might be more yellowish, orangish. Uh, but yeah, we'll definitely see uh, <laughs> when this thing lights, it gets off the pad in a hurry with those massive solid rocket boosters. This is, this is similar to like a, a space shuttle uh, without the orbiter. This is, that's what the Ariane 5 kind of reminds me of. It's two giant solid rocket boosters, a single sustainer engine instead of the RS-25 main engines on the space shuttle. Just one... Um, one, a lot less powerful version, but, um, wow, there is some wildlife going crazy right now. Um, yeah. All right, let's keep going here. Uh, this is, this is from Michael Maxi. Remember, guys, too, if you want uh, your comments up on screen, just have a good question, and maybe our mods will catch it. And thank you to our mods for uh, for hanging out with us on Christmas morning or Christmas afternoon. This is the most stressful launch for the astronomical, astronomical community and spaceflight community, and I think science community at a whole. Yeah, this is this is just crazy. So, uh, yeah, let's see here. Uh, we had a, a membership from Tom Kennedy. Thank you, uh, members. You will get you know early access to some things. Uh, 
just like you do if you're a Patreon supporter. So thank you to all of the people that help me uh, do what I do and hopefully do more and more of it. Uh, from Caesar loving the jumper. Yes, my mom gave this. My mom and dad gave this to me last year. It's about as about as ugly as it gets, and I love it. It's Santa, the astronaut. Yeah, it's good. It's it's appropriate for for uh, for Christmas morning. <laughs> uh, Let's see. Uh, <laughs> Tim says for the non uh, the non bull shizzle delivery. NASA guys are driving me nuts with their cheesy uh, hyper in inflection fakeness. Well, um, I mean that is the, the traditional broadcasting way. I think that's uh, you know that's the way that it's just kind of always been done in those realms. Uh, I I can tell you this though, having spoken personally and hung out with Dr. Michelle Thaler, who's the main host uh, for a full day uh, back in twenty. 16, she is incredible, or 2017, I think, I don't remember, around there. Uh, she is infectious, and her, her tone is genuine. Um, what I don't like about that kind of presentation is they make her uh, asking questions that she knows the answers to. I wish that she would say, you know, that they would script it so it's like, a common question is, can you talk about that? And so she'd be like, now why do planets, you know, it's like, you, you, you know this, you know, like don't have your brilliant host who's one of the smartest humans in the world, uh, you know, asking questions like that. Like that's one of the things that irks me about the, that, that way of doing things. Um, cause she is so brilliant. I mean, yeah, just look at her, her laundry list of, of, of missions and, and things she's taken a part of. She is, um, uh, unbelievable. So yeah. Uh, from Nick Perry, happy boxing day from, uh, Etori, I don't even, I don't even know what that is. A, a, thank you very much, um, Doctor Bright. Thank you. Um, hey Tim, I've been a fan of your channel for a while and always tune in here for big launches. I'm hyped for. Have a happy holiday. Thank you so much. It, it is a, it's, it's unusually warm here in Iowa. Yesterday it was 52 degrees Fahrenheit. So like, I don't know what is that like 12 or something, uh, 12 ish, 13 ish uh, Celsius. Uh, it was unusually warm. Normally it's below zero or, below, or it's freezing. You know, it's, it's normally like, uh, say 20 degrees Fahrenheit or like minus four or five Celsius. Uh, so yeah, very happy to be, uh, having a, a, a nice, just beautiful, uh, Christmas with the family and a uh, beautiful holiday season. Um, okay. So this is a good question. Uh, why Ariane space? Is it really the best option? What is better about Ariane five than others? This is a really good question. Extreme Julius. So uh, there's a few things here. Oh. Merry Christmas to our worldwide audience. From our broadcast booth, here in Kourou. Kourou. Joining me today et for this historic launch, my colleague Luis Fabregat, Luis Fabregat, head of infrastructure and value chain for the European Space Agency. Luis, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Great to be with you. Great to be with you today. I'm not loving the Bonjour, Rob. Nice to be here with you and all of you watching us for this. This is launched by the by the French, the Ariane Space, so it needs to be in, in French and English, but I don't know why they're broadcasting both. 13 minutes, 32 uh, seconds and counting. Out on the launch pad, everything is in great shape. Don't let those clouds fool you. We are go for launch. The latest weather briefing just completed indicated that all weather parameters are green. We have a green board here in the control center, and everything has gone extremely smoothly in the countdown. About nine minutes to go, a major milestone passed as the James Webb Space Telescope. All right, this is a little too confusing for my ears. I can't handle this. Um, I'll try and listen in and let you guys know. I'll also try and do some some audio stuff. And here we go. Actually, I can just do this. I can go desktop audio and then mix this down to mono. And we don't have to, we can hopefully hear. Let me know if this works for you guys. Earlier, telescope controllers reported good environmental readings from sensors inside the fairing encapsulating the telescope atop the upper stage of the Ariane 5 rocket. Okay. And Luce, as we enter the most critical phase of the countdown, can you outline some of the upcoming critical activities as we head into the phase called synchronized sequence? Yes, Rob. We are now reaching the end of this uh, 11 hour sequence that we call the chronology and that started yesterday evening. All systems here have been prepared for the final launch operations. And at the time being, it's quite, it's, it's, it's rather quiet now inside the launch table and also inside the launcher. 
we were told a few minutes ago by the launch control center here that the launcher fleets and electric systems are ready for the final automated sequence. They are on hold now, waiting for the last weather report at minus 10 minutes. After this weather report, three minutes later, we will have the beginning of this famous uh, synchronized sequence when all systems will be made ready for the liftoff. This sequence will first be run by the ground calculator, and then the onboard computer will take the lead step by step, and the launch vehicle will be made autonomous from the ground system. Okay, I, I'm you know I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to answering Extreme Julius. I see so many good questions. I want to get to these. Um, but it looks like everything's good to go. We're again T minus eleven minutes from history. Um, but Extreme Julius had a really good question: Why Ariane Space? Uh, is it really the best option? What is better about Ariane Five than others? Well, number one, it's the only rocket with a large enough payload fairing uh, to actually really be able to fit all of this in uh, properly. It is huge. It's a five point four meter wide fairing. Uh, I think it's only about four point eight or four point six meters internally, but that is like stuffing it to the brim. And that's exactly what James Webb Space Telescope does. It stuffs that thing to the brim. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, so there's that. <laughs> that's important. But also, what's cool about this is this is one of the things that ESA's uh, basically donating the launch. So ESA's paying for the launch. That's part of their collaboration with the James Webb Space Telescope is they're paying for the launch. Uh, you know, it's a, a not insignificant amount of money, likely you know, 500 million or something, I'm not sure the exact number, compared to the $10 billion telescope inside, it's, it's you know, it's obviously not the biggest piece of the pie today, but it is a very generous uh, contribution is to be able to, to provide the launch vehicle. So, um, yeah, that's part of the international collaboration. Um, people ask things like, you know, why not Falcon Heavy? Um, Falcon Heavy would not have the fairing size, the, the width, nor the height with its standard. It also can't be vertically integrated, meaning you can't just... Uh, the, the James Webb Space Telescope had to be dropped down on top of the payload adapter the, while the fairings were off, and then they could encapsulate it. The Falcon Heavy and Falcon 9 get encapsulated horizontally while they're on their side, and they roll out to the launch pad and rise to vertical. Um, this needed to be vertically integrated, so that's another thing that Falcon Heavy can't do. Also, when this mission was conceived and, and paid for and planned out, Falcon Heavy was barely a paper rocket at that point, you know. Um, it was it was basically a PowerPoint and a pretty animation. Um, so it was far from an option for this for this particular ride. Um, yeah. Um, all right, so uh, let's keep going here. Uh, I know we have a lot of people. Don't worry, we'll get to the check. We will get to the check, my friends. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's... I hope that we get back to the shots of the rocket here. I, I will listen in a little bit myself to make sure I'm not missing anything. Oh. Actually, weather. Just a couple of days, but right now everybody is very focused on the next steps. The start of the synchronized sequence at seven minutes before liftoff. Last operations that Luz described earlier before Webb and the Ariane 5 are going to lift off and soar into the sky. Thanks, Raphael. We'll be back with you and Luce here shortly. Uh, we now have confirmation from Baltimore that James Webb is on internal power. Amidst all of this activity, we cannot forget that it is Christmas Day. 53 years ago, the astronauts of Apollo 8 completed their 10th and final orbit of the moon after reading from the book of Genesis on Christmas Eve to billions of people watching with rapt attention back on our planet. The astronauts then headed for home following their spacecraft's trans-Earth injection burn. Today, more than a half century later, we're just minutes away from another genesis, the genesis of new era of discovery. The launch of the James Webb Space Telescope is at hand. Very cool. Okay, so, um Let's see. Uh, th th thank you so much to, to Physics Gamer or Games for uh, uh, this is that Lagrange Point Two Earth Earth Sun Lagrange Point Two the ESA uh, Gaia probe and the uh, the joint Russian German High Energy Astrophysics Observatory Spectre RG. So there are two other vehicles out at the same la similar Lagrange Point. It's not like they're going to physically run into each other. They're still in this kind of little bit of a halo orbit. There's a lot of space out there. Um, all right. Let's see. We're into the final sequence here. 
Top. À Jérôme, 7 minutes. And with that, we've entered uh, the period of uh, synchronized sequence. You heard uh, Luce Fabriguet just a moment or two ago uh, uh, explain uh, some of the critical activities. Uh, the first one coming up just a few seconds from now, which will be the uh, topping off of the main okay, stage. Cool. So everything's still going smoothly. We have about six more minutes. Okay, uh, this is a really good question from Rexalot. Now, this vehicle, James Webb Space Telescope, only has a 10-year operating mission. After 10 years, it'll basically run out of the maneuvering thruster and the propellant inside the maneuvering thrusters that kind of keep station keeping. You have to keep keep uh, you know using those occasionally. There are reaction wheels on this vehicle to help point it and steer it and guide it uh, and keep it steady. There's six of them. But the, the problem is they get what's called saturated. So eventually they spin up so much that they need to be desaturated. And during that time, you do have to use thrusters. You also have to fine tune your orbits occasionally just to be perfect uh, using, using some of your propellant. So there's a little tiny bit of propellant on this vehicle, but that little tiny bit of propellant can last about 10 years um, if it goes well. The question being, if, it, if this all works great and 10 years, could we send something to service it? Um, sending humans that far, uh, there currently are no real legitimate capabilities for that, so that would kind of be out of the question. But things like Northrop Grumman's uh, MEV, the Mission Extension Vehicle, could maybe be an option, and that can actually go up and dock with the basically dock with the engine bell of a rocket engine or a, a spacecraft's engine, uh, basically hold on to the engine and then use be able to like refuel and top it off and do things uh, servicing wise to it. I don't know if that's a possibility, but I think there already there's some talks of there already being some feasibility options on the table, uh, depending on you know how this all goes. If it's all going great, then yeah, this might be such a valuable asset. We'd want to try to extend this mission beyond 10 years, and we do, as of 2020, have some autonomous uh, options there. You know, robotic options that can actually go and service vehicles and extend their mission life. And this would be one that I would absolutely love to see. Uh, be extended because I think 10 years, you know, if this does what it's what it's promised to do, will be worthy of a massive extension. Wow, thank you so much, everyone, uh, with the generous super chats this morning. I really appreciate it. Um, the, I'll, I'll keep trying to answer questions again, non super chat questions and super chat questions. I might not get to them all before the launch, and then as soon as this thing deploys, I'm gonna go enjoy family time. I'm gonna enjoy Christmas morning with my family. So. Uh, I, I apologize if I'm unable to get to you guys, uh, but this is a good question from Rigel. What is the megapixel of James Webb Space Telescope? Uh, I believe it's the total resolution ends up being about 16 megapixels. Um, now that's not just total, you know, that is of, there's actually four sensors kind of all blocked together. Uh, they split some of the sensors. There's a lot of extra instruments besides just like the imager. Um, so that's, you know, the end result can be about 16 megapixels, but don't forget you can do panoramas and keep extending that to be hundreds of megapixels. You know, just like you can stitch together photos with your phones or your cameras, uh, you know, you can do that similar thing with, with uh, telescopes and, and, and assets like this too, so. All right, um, let's see, what's in the boosters? The boosters are solid rocket boosters, so they're quite literally just uh, like almost a rubber propellant uh, with its has its oxidizer and the fuel built in very similar again to the space shuttles solid boosters um, in the center though this the core of the vehicle the center part is all liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen both stages the first stage and the second stage are um, yeah are, are liquid liquid hydrogen which are very efficient has a lot of potential for a high efficiency uh, but they're also very sparse and undense so they have huge tanks so this vehicle always looks bigger. Uh, it's a lot lighter than some other rockets that would be similar to this. So, um, uh, let's see. Yeah, hopefully we answered all the questions, you know, about why the Ariane 5. Um, let's see, this is from Juan Fran. Do you think this would be the last important launch from Ariane Space, taking into account Starship Merry Christmas um, from Spain? Uh, I, I mean, I'm sure Ariane Space, you know, they're working on the Ariane, 5, or Ariane 6, um, I do, you know, I, I don't think it's going to be their last important mission. I think they have quite the life ahead of them. They, they've proven to be quite reliable too. So, um, all right, let, let me keep talking here a little bit here. We're coming up on T minus two minutes. Holy cow. 30 years in the making, my friends, 30 years coming up to this point to launch this, this vehicle. So, um, wow. 
Um, the, I want to get to that question right now uh, from the legacy. There's a lot of double time and and half uh, double time and a half on payroll at NASA today. Surprised they didn't wait another window. Well, they've waited 30 years. This vehicle needs to get off the ground ASAP. It's probably cheaper to get it in the air than to. Oh, they're all going outside to see the launch. It's getting real. Oh, I would want to have been out there the whole time. <laughs> now they're like T minus one and a half minutes. It's like run. Run, get outside, you're about to see the craziest thing. Oh man, okay, coming up on... Um, yeah, so I don't know a ton about this. There is the, the possibility if the upper stage burns a little too long or overperforms, which is uh, less likely than it underperforming. Um, it is hard for the James Webb Space Telescope to slow itself down because of the orientation of the thrusters. So. T minus one minute. All right, I've got a very important thing to go here. Uh, I have to perform the pointy end up, flamey end down. So uh, based on this image, it's actually a really good uh, perspective image. I can confirm the pointy end is up, the flamey end is down of the James Webb Space Telescope, my friends. I've been waiting, personally, I've been waiting about six or seven years since I first learned about this to see this thing fly. Here it is, Christmas morning, the ultimate package. Now I want to tell you what to expect, the center engine is going to light up and run right at T0, and then it sits there on the pad for a long time, like seven seconds before it takes off. So don't panic if it's just sitting there running. You're like, what is going on? That is okay. I'm gonna listen in here. Fingers crossed, everybody. Merry Back Christmas. To the video. Attention pour les deux Go James finale. Webb. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, unité, top. I said it'll sit here for a second. And we have engine start. And liftoff. <laughs> Decollage, liftoff from a tropical rainforest to the edge of time itself. James Webb begins a voyage back to the birth of the universe. Punching a hole through the clouds, 20 seconds into the flight, good pitch program reported. Trajectory nominal. Okay, Vehicle performance is nominal. The Ariane 5 rocket continues uh, to fly uphill in nominal fashion. The rumble of the powerful Ariane 5 now being felt here in the control center. 3D animation. Shoot, they don't have better... I would have thought they would have brought out all the the other assets here. So this is just a... Okay, but we can look at the actual velocity down there. It will be real-time. But the animation is not real-time, so that's pre-programmed animation, I believe. The trajectory reported to be nominal by Jean-Luc Voyer, the uh, range operations manager. You can see at the bottom of your screen, the yellow line is the trajectory plot perfectly overlaid over the green line, which was the pre-launch trajectory. One minute, 41 seconds into the flight, about 40 seconds away from shutdown of the solid rocket boosters. Coming up on the two minute mark into the flight, When it detects the threshold on acceleration, the dis not the deceleration, but uh, less acceleration for the... Are, are, everything is okay. Everything is normal. Two and minutes, 15 seconds into the flight. Here comes booster separation. When the computer detects this threshold, it will separate. Separation des EAP. Done. We have confirmation of solid rocket booster separation from Jean-Luc Voyer. This coming at an altitude of 44 miles. The Ariane 5 and James Webb traveling almost 5,000 miles an hour. Next will be fairing separation. We have about one minute, five seconds to go before fairing jettison. That'll be the next critical milestone. The fairing is there to avoid the satellite being exposed to high temperatures and also high air flows. And as soon as the launcher 
leaves the atmosphere, as is now the case, the satellite does not need anymore to be protected, and, and web does not need anymore to be protected. So each kilogram being very important for the performance of the launch, we are going to eject this no more useful fairing. And let's go down to the floor uh, in the Jupiter Control Center to Raphael Chevrier of Ariane Spas. Raphael, so far so good. Hi, Rob. So far so good. Everything is nominal, as uh, we say, when attitude and trajectory of the Ariane 5 is going perfectly well. As you can see also on the yellow line, de la coiffe. on the screen, we had the confirmation of the uh, separation of the two solid boosters and now of the fairing, meaning that we have crossed the limits of the atmosphere. So everything is going super good. And the DDO just said that all parameters are going perfectly, yes. perfectly smoothly. So let's continue the mission. And Raphael, uh, this is a view uh, from the upper stage camera called the Vicky Cam, looking back at the James Webb Space Telescope. This is on about a 20 second delay or so because of the way the imagery is processed uh, here in the control room. Oh, There's your awesome. telescope ready it's to unfurl uh, its uh, wings, basically, and begin uh, its uh, journey to a, the Lagrange point, the L2 point, about a million miles away from Earth. Wow. The trajectory is nominal. Trajectory is nominal. The report from Jean-Luc Voyer. The liftoff time confirmed here in the Mission Control Center at 12.20 Greenwich Mean Time, 9.20 a.m. Peru Time, 7.20 a.m. Eastern Time. The Ariane 5 and James Webb, 181 uh, kilometers in altitude, 450 kilometers downrange from the launch site here in Kourou. Flight control is very smooth. Trajectory. Five minutes, 12 seconds into the flight. We have about uh, three and a half minutes to go in uh, main stage or first stage uh, performance. And again, you can see at the bottom of your screen the uh, yellow uh, plot line overlaid over the green line, meaning uh, we are right on course, right down the pike, and a perfect trajectory so far for the Ariane 5 rocket. So basically, the core stage here pretty much puts the vehicle into orbit. You know, it's, it's again, similar to the space shuttle, where it's uh, a sustainer engine, so it's running from sea level all the way to pretty much orbit, um, and then the, it'll separate, and then the upper stage has to do the final insertion and the injection. Um, wow. Sorry, I'm just like speechless that it's going well. This is fantastic. Up in the middle of the ocean and the two last stations in Africa, Libreville and Malindi, one on the east coast, the other one on the west coast. And the one on the west coast, Malindi, you can see that the satellite will be, the telescope will be separated more, over, more or less over this Malindi station. And this Malindi station will also acquire the telemetry data from the telescope. You can see both are green, Galio and Dantal on this animation. It means they are expected to receive the, da the data, and it was confirmed right now by the launch operations manager. That Acquisition de telemesure par la station du Natal au Brésil. And just confirming now that telemetry is being processed uh, through the Brazilian tracking station. The telescope is also. Uh, processing telemetry through the tracking and data relay satellite system as it uh, moves further and further out into deep space. All of the telescope's uh, telemetry and its imagery ultimately will be processed through the deep space network in Goldstone, California. We passed the seven minute mark into the flight. A perfect ride uh, so far on the Ariane 5. We have about uh, one and a half minutes to go in the first stage performance. Once uh, the main stage uh, engine is commanded to cut off, it will be uh, jettisoned. And just a few seconds after that, the upper stage engine will, will ignite. And it uh, will be the workhorse for a 16-minute burn that will put uh, James Webb into its preliminary orbit. Man, yeah, so the upper stage will burn for 16 minutes. 
That is about crazy. 11 minutes from now, uh, telescope controllers at uh, the Space Telescope Science Institute will be sending commands to prepare James Webb for the initial uh, series of commissioning activities uh, that will lead to, to the deployment of its solar Keep array and uh, the initiation of generation of electrical power for the telescope. About 30 seconds away from main engine cutoff, Like we said, the, basically the, the, the trajectory is normal. Trajectory is still normal. normal. <laughs> I did say normal. Uh, the yeah, the, the first stage basically puts it into orbit. You know, um, with a light enough payload, it absolutely would be capable of that. Similar to how do you remember earlier this year, China uh, had a rocket where it's similar to this, has a sustainer core like this, and they actually let it get into orbit, and then they didn't intentionally run it short of orbit, like this will. There we go. And we have main stage shutdown and separation confirmed here in the Mission Control Center and the ignition of that upper Allumage stage. ESC. And Raphael Chevrier down uh, in the fishbowl. Uh, so far, so good. Yes, Rob, we have the confirmation of the separation of the main stage. The second stage engine is about 440 seconds of specific impulse, if I recall. Very important moment for us because it's always a, re uh, a challenge to switch on a cryogenic engine in space condition and we are now at 220 kilometers of altitude. Speed is a bit more than seven kilometers per second as we enter now the second stage of uh, the second uh, phase uh, of uh, the flight. The upper stage is going to power for about, calm. for about 16 minutes to place Webb on its transfer orbit and right now everything is again nominal as the DDO just said. And a short time from now, uh, the uh, so-called sawtooth maneuver uh, will get underway. The, again, uh, like rocking a baby in a cradle, this will be a maneuver to keep Webb's optics protected from overheating loose. Exactly, Rob, like a baby in a cradle. Uh, you can see here Webb attached on top of Ariane 5 upper stage with a very specific configuration. Of course, it will be different uh, during its lifetime, but for the time being, it's, uh, it's, it's sun shield is folded and not yet Three fully protected in the observatory. A number of uh, exhaustive studies have been performed by the mission teams in, in Europe, in the US, on the thermal conditioning inside the telescope and the way the rays of the sun would propagate and interact with sensitive equipment. I did want to point out and, and rest assured that, yes, the, the rocket and the vehicle is actually going down in altitude a little bit, and that's okay. What they do is they loft up at, before stage separation. They get the vehicle in a lofted trajectory. And then you actually do want to be as close, uh, as low as you can when you're doing a, an injection burn like this. Um, the higher you are, you're actually going slightly slower. So the O-birth effect is what that's called, is where the closer you are to the planet, the planetary body where you're doing your, your injection burn, the faster you're actually traveling uh, at the same relative, everything else relative, you're faster if you're closer. So, uh, so they actually want to be kind of like getting as close as they can and this is a very low power second stage if i recall it's only like 70 kilonewtons or something it's a very low power second stage actually here's it's 67 kilonewtons um so it you know it just will sit there and burn for a long time and it's okay that the altitude goes down what we're worried about here is the thing that at the bottom left says uh vitesse or something like that and that's velocity uh it's currently at 7.5 7.56 kilometers per second um, I'm not exactly sure what the end number is. It's probably going to be around 10 and a half or 11. Uh, you know, a moon mission's about 11, if I recall correctly, or 10 and a half. Um, so, or 11, I think. So this is probably around 11 and a half. It's beyond the moon. Uh, so we're just worried about that number really so much and not necessarily the altitude. So don't worry if the altitude's going down. I just wanted to give you a little bit of... Yeah, we'll get I'm still here. Uh, uh, that uh, electricity is flowing the radio, through so the array. That call uh, will come from the mission operations oh, man. manager, Carl Starr, guys, <laughs> who's at the uh, space team. If you guys taking a breath yet, I want to remind you to breathe. Uh, if you're anything like me, sincerely, this is this is a big deal. Um, this is, you know, one of the most expensive single missions ever. I think it is the most expensive single mission payload. Like one payload being worth so much money, $10 billion. And... Uh, 
this is uh yeah this is a big deal the fact that this is going smoothly is is everything so um yeah so state separation of our recalls at t plus 27 minutes i will be with you guys until just after that and then i'm gonna wrap up and go spend christmas with my family so uh everything's going perfectly smoothly though so far this particular mechanism helps with heater La control of the fine steering mirror, preventing water ice con uh, condensation later to be used uh, to position each of the mirror's segments. All six reaction wheels and the wheel drive electronics will be powered on for Webb, and that will be the precursor to the attitude control system using those reaction wheels to maintain the proper orientation with the sun, as opposed to using onboard thrusters. Uh, of course, fuel uh, in those thrusters, very valuable. It's a, a limited commodity for the lifetime of James Webb's uh, observations of the universe. We're 13 minutes, 55 seconds Philippe into the flight. Jean-Luc uh, Voyer, the uh, range operations manager, continues to report a nominal performance for James Webb. And again, uh, Luz Fabregat from the European Space Agency. Uh, how is this uh, trajectory uh, being uh, carefully and methodically adjusted uh, to provide the uh, correct parameters uh, in the final stages of ascent? Yes, Rob, as you can see on this plot, the, the altitude is slightly going down. It's perfectly normal. The large vehicle is uh, really on the, on the line where it should be. This decrease of its altitude, slight decrease of its altitude, will allow the launcher to benefit and the upper stage to benefit of the gravity effect and to increase its velocity until it reaches a thermal threshold. It's about to reach it or even already reached, reached it now, and it will go up. And now it will go up and up, up to the separation of the Webb telescope. It will separate the Webb so yeah, telescope. On, on that, people are asking in our Discord channel, why is the trajectory going down and then back up? And she kind of explained it there again. Because of the Oberth effect, you want to get as close as you can, but you even at 180 you know, 185 kilometers in altitude, uh, or about a, just over 100, 110, um, at about 110 miles in altitude, there's still actually a decent amount of atmosphere. I mean, there's a non, non-negligible, like there are, there is some atmosphere. The, you know, the atmosphere doesn't just stop once you get to 100 kilometers. You know, we, we define space as 100 kilometers, but it's not like at 100 kilometers, all of a sudden the atmosphere just turns off. It slowly tapers away, just like when you climb a mountain, you know, you can feel the, the air getting thinner when you're up on an airplane. You know, at 10 kilometers, it's it's even thinner yet. It just continues until it's thinner and thinner and thinner until it eventually is basically more or less gone, right? And so what they're doing is, so you, there's a trade-off here where you want to, in your orbit, when you're doing your injection, again, you want to be as close to the planetary body as possible doing your injection burn because it's actually, it's basically... Notice, it, look at it, literally that trajectory line down there looks like a, a downward thing like this, you know? It literally was going downhill during that period where it's going down. It was gaining 9.8 meters per second of acceleration from Earth. Earth was literally pulling it back down. And they're kind of using Earth, as a, in a sense, to slingshot it out to its destination. But now they were talking about on air that they can't exceed a, a certain thermal threshold because, again, they were going, you know, 8 kilometers per second with a little bit of atmosphere, it can start to actually warm up the spacecraft. So they had to mitigate that. Uh, so that's why it's now beginning to go back up. And also because of orbital, uh, how orbital mechanics work, they're speeding up so much now the the orbit is starting to increase and that's going to end up just rise, raising their orbit. So opposite of them, so on the other side of Earth right now, they're basically, you can imagine like a hula hoop growing away from this vehicle. And they're starting to climb that hula hoop now. So you'll now see the altitude go up pretty drastically just because their velocity is getting so high, they are beginning to just leave planet Earth now with this vehicle. So uh, sorry if that was a little bit long-winded, but... Rob, the velocity you just mentioned at separation of the telescope is very important. It will be slightly below, okay, I give it in a kilometer per second, but it will be slightly below 10 kilometer per second because it's important that the satellite, the telescope, is not inserted on an escape orbit. It will be placed on a terrestrial orbit so that there will be time for the layoff, for, for the early phase operations on the, and the commissioning of the telescope. And that will be, in fact, the upper stage that will leave this orbit 
and goes toward an escape liberation orbit. And of course, even uh, though we're still in powered flight, the uh, trajectory, the acceleration, the speed at which James Webb is going towards its preliminary orbit, all modeled in advance, uh, in advance and uh, carefully choreographed to maintain as a quiescent an atmosphere and environment around the telescope uh, for its ultimate separation from the upper stage of the Ariane 5 rocket, which is about uh, six and a half minutes from now. Yeah, so six and a half more minutes before, yeah. Before 18 and a half minutes into the flight. It's very quiet now here in the uh, control center here in Karoo. NASA officials, European Space Agency officials, Ariane Spas officials, all watching uh, telemetry very carefully. So I wanted to remind you guys that so the, they, they will be separating James Webb from the upper stage of the rocket at about 27 minutes. And then it's a two-week process to basically really even begin to unfrill all of this stuff. Uh, so we're there, and, and then even uh, another two weeks to really get it like fully online uh, to the point where like everything's checked out. And then six months total like to calibrate it and really get it into science mode. Because that's what's nuts is it has all these mirrors. You see those hexagon mirrors. They have to. They can fine tune each and every one of those to like the most unbelievably accurate uh, alignment with with the secondary instrument and the secondary mirror. Um, and and uh, I I think I heard that it the the motors that spin and, and adjust those mirrors uh, can move at the rate of a piece of grass growing. That's how accurate we're talking about. Think about the, the grass in your lawn growing. That's how slow the motors that steer these mirrors. That's why this thing is just going to be so next level. It can fine tune its focus to just the absolute most absurd degree. Um, so we're really expecting really big things out of this, this telescope. And so far, everything is looking fantastic um, right down the middle. And that trajectory is just looking fantastic. Countdown uh, was as flawless as uh, you can imagine. Uh, the weather uh, was perfect uh, all the way through the early morning hours, uh, through the uh, fueling process of the vehicle. The weather's been a bit dicey here in Karoo over the past few days, but everything fell together on this Christmas day uh, to send uh, a new present to the world's astronomer. 20 minutes, 40 seconds into the flight. Trajectory normal. All parameters nominal, as reported by Jean-Luc Voyer, the range operations manager. Four minutes of powered flight remaining. questions do you guys have yeah I mean this is I love how I said like we're delivering a gift for the ast astronomy community again this really the implications of this of this telescope are I mean it'll make help remember when Hubble you know some of the most famous images of Hubble is when it decided that they aimed at a completely blank patch of sky or a relatively blank patch of sky where there really wasn't anything of any interest and just sat there and exposed that darkness for I think it was like 10 days and uh, when they did that, we realized that isn't empty. It's, and we, they exposed literally like thousands of galaxies. And we were like, oh, my word. You know, just really was eye-opening of this, like, kind of this, this moment of, wow, this is, everything is so much, you know, grander and bigger and, and, uh, and just provided this new perspective that, that, the, that us humans have never had before. Uh, James Webb might, be, might take that times another level because now we're able to go so much further back in time, basically. Um, you know, theoretically, as close to basically as, as close as physically possible to the uh, the the first things that were emitting light, uh, or really close, only about a hundred million years after the Big Bang, uh, it should be able to detect some of those photons still, which is absolutely wild. Um, so yeah, this is a really really big deal. 
And uh, I can't even begin to imagine what types of things and what types of discoveries this this telescope could have. I mean, we just you, you don't know. You don't the unknowns are unknown. You know, the cool thing is, you know, how this works is you can theorize, you can you can have hypotheses and then you can start to do collect data and, and see how that lends to your theory. And eventually, you know, if if you keep trying to prove your stuff wrong and everything is saying, hey, no, actually we collected the data, it's completely correct. Uh, you can start to be like, okay, well, that's now a scientific consensus, and that's what this what this vehicle, what this telescope will be able to do, is really check off. I think a lot more of those potential unknowns, a lot of those things that we just don't really understand about our universe. Uh, this will really be able to sit there and go, you know what? Look at that was exactly right. Or what can be even more exciting is, hey, we didn't quite have that right. Now, we, wh why did, why is this like this? How did this happen? Um, and that's to me just as exciting as anything. So, um, yeah, here we go. We're coming up on one minute of powered flight remaining. We have one minute of powered flight left. Yeah, this is a good point too. Jesper says, uh, where did that go? Jesper said, uh, I hope they, they redo the deep field image with James Webb space telescope so we can compare them. I would love to, if we use both of them, like to be able to observe, uh, something together in the night sky. I think that'd be amazing. You know, some kind of, uh, you know, think about the stereo imaging you'd have of two powerful telescopes like this looking at the same object, uh, you know, in our own solar system. Even that's what's so cool about this whole thing is, you know, we can use this for the furthest reaches of space. But of course, it's going to be a powerful observatory inside of our own solar system. Even, you just the the options are are endless. You know. Okay, here we go. Waiting for stage shutdown. And we're standing by for upper stage shutdown and uh, the cutoff of the uh, upper stage engine. Extraction OSC. Tous les paramètres à bord sont normaux. The extinction of the, the shutoff of the, the cutoff of the engine was confirmed exactly as expected. Yes. With the exactly expected altitude and speed and velocity. So now we, yes. are, we have entered the coasting phase, the ballistic phase that will last for a little more than two minutes. Good job, Ariane Space. Wow, I and cannot the imagine the stress. I cannot imagine the stress of that one being like, we have the most important payload in human history to date. This has to go perfectly. I mean, I just can't imagine the stress that they're going through. So huge congrats. So the next thing we're waiting on is the separation of the telescope and the second stage. There's a payload adapter that'll basically let go of it and push it away. And that's what we're waiting on here at about uh, T plus 27 minutes. Um, this is a good question here from Neil Holmes. Um, what's one thing I'd like be most excited to see this detect anything I've really thought about for sure. I'm excited for it to, to look at exoplanets. I want this thing to be pointing at some of these, you know, planets that we know about that are orbiting distant stars, right? You know, other solar systems, because this will have resolution and be able to detect things and, and make discoveries about, um, other solar systems that we just simply cannot do right now, especially in the infrared spectrum. A lot of planets, uh, you know, absorb a lot of the, the visible light spectrum and seeing it in the infrared, you can gain a lot more data, a lot more, collect a lot more knowledge when looking at an exoplanet uh, with a telescope like this. So it's going to be really, really cool. That's something that I'm looking most forward to. Here we go. Separation. That's just the animation. Let's wait for the call out. Separation Web Space Telescope. Go Web! Oh. We do have confirmation of observatory separation. The James Webb Space Telescope amidst applause here in the Mission Control Center now taking its first steps in pursuit of cosmological discovery. Ariane Space, everyone, 
not only applause for James Webb so far, but huge props to Ari on space. Again, that would be the most terrifying launch. I can't imagine. Yes. Controllers. There's that downlink. Okay. And there is the view uh, from the upper stage camera on the Ariane 5 looking at the James Webb Space Telescope as it moves uh, gently away from go its launch ahead, vehicle. That's so cool. Fantastic pictures of this telescope. Go right? Webb, go Webb. Yes, go Webb. Ironically enough, as we marvel on uh, this view from the upper stage camera, this will be humanity's last view of the James Webb te Space Telescope as it moves to its work uh, place about a million miles away from Earth. Yes, you're right, Rob. Yeah. Impressive, fantastic pictures, yeah. Now we'll be hearing uh, shortly from the mission operations manager at the Space Telescope Science Institute, uh, Carl Starr, who will be uh, calling out uh, the procedures that will lead uh, to the deployment of Webb's solar array. Yep. At six minutes after separation, we should see those. Oh, already. I guess we're seeing them already. And down uh, in the fishbowl uh, where there is jubilation, let's go to Raphael uh, Chevrier of Ariane Spas. And before we do that, uh, Raphael, uh, uh, a bit earlier than planned, but there is the solar array having been deployed. James Webb now uh, has its array out as we stand by for a confirmation that it is power positive. Sweet. Hey, Rob. And there it is. There's your critical call. James Webb not only has legs, but it has power as it uh, begins uh, its journey and the commissioning activities to follow. And with that, let's go down to the floor uh, in the fishbowl and uh, Raphael Chevrier of Ariane Spas. This is it. We have witnessed and the confirmation that Ariane 5 has safely delivered Webb into space. The upper stage is now being placed on a safe um, escape orbit around the Sun. But honestly, I've got to tell you that these images are absolutely incredible. And it, well, it may be the end of the mission for Ariane Space, but it's only the beginning of the journey for Webb. It's now on its way to the Lagrange point. Congratulations to all the team involved in the flight. Really, there is no words to describe the emotion that uh, is happening right now in the fishbowl. So, uh, all I can say is good luck, Webb, and bring us incredible data from the deep universe. At that point, our sequence will continue. Well, Raphael, uh, congratulations on a uh, perfect ride to orbit uh, from the Ariane 5 out of Kourou here today. A view here in the uh, Space Telescope Science Institute. Their work just beginning on a new era of scientific observations. Uh, Luce Fabregat, uh, it was a smooth ride to orbit. Everything went uh, by the book, almost like a simulation, without any problems. And uh, we thank you for all of your insights. So this is a really good question here from uh, one computer guy here. Um, can you explain the orbit they're using? From the renders they had up uh, throughout the process, it seemed the orbit was an escaped orbit instead of a geostationary one. It's basically an escape orbit. So just to explain here, a geostationary orbit is an orbit that, that orbits the Earth once every 24 hours. <laughs> that's cool. He's showing a picture of his family on Christmas. Oh, that's sweet. I like that. Yeah, think about all these all these families and that are away, from, you know, all these people that are away from their families on, on during the holidays, um, right now. You know, it's I imagine it's I, I'm sure there's no other place they'd rather be right now, but um, and I'm sure their families are understanding and watching and, and cheering too. But uh, yeah, just keep them in your your thoughts that you know they are working <laughs> on a holiday right now. But what a special holiday! I mean, honestly, I can't even imagine. Uh, but okay, so the orbit, so geostationary orbit is one that orbits the Earth every 24 hours in unison with the rotation of the Earth. So it ends up looking like a stationary object. And that's 
about, oh, I'm gonna forget off the top of my head, something like 400 kilometers away, right? Uh, can someone remind me what the exact orbital distance is? There's a perfect moment where, you know, a certain altitude where if you're at that altitude, you will orbit once every 24 hours. Um, I, I believe, yeah, I believe it's about uh, 380 or something, or 400 kilometers. Uh, 400, sorry, 400,000 kilometers. Yeah, 400,000, something like, like that. Um, 36, there it is, 36,000 kilometers. Okay, way off. 36,000 kilometers, there we go. That's geostationary orbit. This is going out uh, beyond a, a 1.6 million kilometers. So uh, yeah, it's it's substantially further out. It's basically at escape trajectory. Like it's just shy of escape trajectory. And then what's happening is it's getting, uh, in it's going to the point of where uh, its orbit gets raised exactly opposite of the sun. So it's it's peak orbit where it will where it's basically going to stop because don't forget an orbit is fastest at the lowest point and slowest at the highest point. So it's going up there, and they just had to insert it up there perfectly so that it's like going so slow, and once they get up to the very top, they basically just tap the brakes for just a tiny, just go zoop, with a little tiny burn, and that'll park them right there. And what's going to happen is the gravitational pull of both the Earth and the Sun will keep them at this orbit. And this orbit is, is you know, one point something million miles away or something around two, two million kilometers away. Uh, and it's going to stay in sync there because the Earth and the Sun are both pulling on it equally. And it'll kind of be in this little halo orbit, just going around where the sun, it'll basically always be blocked more or less, not directly blocked. Um, but the sun will, the earth will always be between it and the sun. Um, and it's just this nice stable orbit and it's really, really, really cool. So, um, yeah, it's so, it's, uh, I, I'm really excited for that. So, all right. Um, I think guys, I think that's going to do it, do it for me. Um, uh, yeah, thank guys. I, I'm going to head out. Um, I'll, I'm going to be staying in touch with this all day as, as things occur. Um, let's see. So don't forget guys. Um, I will be having a lot of stuff coming out here in the next week as my Christmas present to you. Now that the Soviet rocket engine video is done. If you haven't seen the Soviet rocket engine video and you're home for the holidays, looking for stuff to do, please give it a watch. Um, it's, it was a complete labor of love, two years in the making, four years of like, or four months of just like straight editing. Uh, so finally, now that that's done, you can tell I might be like breathing better and like excited about things. Hence, we're putting out three videos here in the next week, basically. Um, so stay tuned. There's a lot of really fun stuff. Uh, I'm, you know, running on all cylinders now that that stuff is over. So I hope that you guys are as excited for that as I am. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of what else, what else is there to do here, guys, besides go celebrate. I mean, this is an awesome day. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited for this. This is obviously one of the, the biggest days in spaceflight history. Uh, I'm glad that you guys tuned in to watch with me. That really means the world to me. Thank you so much to everyone that did, uh, super chats and, um, and all that stuff. Don't forget, I will have the Astro Awards coming up here. Um, if you guys want to support what I do, consider becoming a Patreon member or a YouTube member. That, of course, helps me. And we're coming up on a crazy launch campaign for Super Heavy. I'm going to be going down in January. And we're going to be continuing to build out that studio to be an actual, legitimate studio for you guys. So that we have the ultimate 4K coverage on launch day of Super Heavy. Of the world's biggest, most powerful rocket to ever fly. We will be covering it in the highest quality, humanly possible. Literally on par with SpaceX. And we'll be able to cover it for you guys all day. So uh, get ready for that, guys. I promise that'll be worth it. Also, as my gift to you, our entire web store today is 10% off if you use coupon code LAUNCHDAY. All one word, all lowercase at checkout. We got a lot of new stuff, uh, including uh, our new Soviet collection with the RD-171 shirts, the R7 shirt, the new, the new space shuttle hoodie, which, by the way, has green strings. When we shot this on model, it had the stock strings. They have actually really cool green strings. Um, and then also, we also have a new, in our schematics collection, we also have a new RS-25 shirt as well. So if you guys want to help support me and continue to do what I do, head over to everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Um, uh, we are not shipping through, through the rest of the year, so just give them some patience. It won't be heading out, uh, of the shop for a, at least like a week or 10 days. So yeah, if you guys want, again, all one word, all lowercase launch day. Uh, that definitely helps me do what I do. And it's just a fun way to be uh, nerdy. Oh, by the way, I, I want to share this because people didn't realize this, why there's this, these uh, this patches on these on this hoodie. 
Um, the hoodie has all these cool patches because it's a replica of the ten, the S ten thirty A, the original space shuttle ejection suit hoodie. So this was the, what they wore on the first floor, first four space shuttle uh, missions where they had the ejection seats. They used uh, this. It was basically an SR seventy one suit modified for the space shuttle. Uh, so we made it like our own version of it, and I just I think it's really cool and really nerdy and really fun. So, yeah. Uh, so that's probably the coolest thing in our shop, in my opinion, right now. Uh, but yeah, thank you guys so much. Uh, it really, again, means the world to me that you all joined in with me this morning. Uh, huge thank you for all of you this year for hanging out with me, for your patience and support and understanding as I worked on the Soviet rocket video and just about lost my mind doing that. Uh, I'm really excited for 2022. There's a lot of incredible stuff in the works. I'm already just like steamrolling through stuff. So I, I can't wait to share with you guys. Um, and thank you to my team, to the mods, to the YouTube mods, our, our website crew, people that have been writing articles and doing just an awesome job with that. Uh, I just want to take a second and, and share my a genuine appreciation for everyone that's helped. Uh, my merch designer, Allie, who does all of the merchandise. She's incredible. Best graphic designer in the world, in my opinion. Gravity Coast is her company, grvtycoast.com. Uh, just incredible. Andrew, who helps edit and, and do all the live stream stuff. Flo, who operates and manages the, the web crew. Um, and just everyone else that, that helps. And the Discord community that, again, keeps me sane. Thank you. Thank you for hanging out. And, and this, this past year was amazing. This is the perfect cherry on the top for the end of the year. Is The successful launch of James Webb Space Telescope is finally in space. It's finally in space. It's going to finally be doing science here relatively soon, hopefully. So... Just, yeah, all the love in the world. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Um, uh, lots more to come. So get ready, guys. Get a big old fat smile on your face today and just get excited for the future because there's a lot of really cool stuff happening. So, all right, everybody. Um, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. That's going to do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, James Webb. See you out of L2, and congratulations to the teams involved. Amazing. Amazing. Goodbye.